Welcome to Englewood, and thank you very much for taking our walking tour today. My name is Amy Hibbard. You're looking around at a place that has been very popular since the dawn of time. It was even popular with the great woolly mammoth. They found one, you know, in warm mineral springs, pretty much intact. Indians lived here from 1000 BC to 1350 AD. The Spanish explorers showed up in Charlotte Harbor. Ponce de Leon came in 1513 and 1521. Hernando de Soto showed up in 1539. And Menendez de Aviles was here in 1566. The first white settler was William Goff, and he came sailing up Lemon Bay in 1878. Start a new life, he thought. When his wife passed away, he married a young Cherokee lady that he met in Cherokee Park down on the bay at the foot of Green Street. There was a small band of Cherokee living there. His descendants are still in the area. In 1893, the Nichols brothers heard about the area at the Chicago Exposition, and in 1896, they platted the town of Englewood, named after their hometown, Englewood, Illinois. The plan was they would sell city lots, and each city lot came with a 10-acre grove lot. They could grow lemons, and they named the bay Lemon Bay. It was a great idea. You could live off the fat of the land, shooting quail and selling lemons. Of course, there came the great freeze of 1894 when the temperature got down to 17, and in January of 1895 it got down to 14. So much for the lemons. The Nichols brothers had to rewrite the brochure. The amended brochure said, most days you can be very comfortable out of doors. Welcome to Inglewood. When I was first asked to write the history column, Back in 1997, I was grateful, and I wondered to myself, how will I ever find something to say about such a small town so recently settled every week? Well, all these years later, I thank that editor on a daily basis for giving me a chance to get to know this fascinating place and its living history. Just a few facts. In 1926, Hollywood stars Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks had planned a sumptuous home not far from the proposed National Memorial University in Little Englewood. An international airport was also on the drawing board. John Ringling and his cronies drilled for oil east of Englewood. Minnesota Key has been home to at least three nudist colonies in the last century. The average monthly rent for an Englewood home in the 30s was $4 a month. There was a Tarzan movie filmed east of town on the Mayaka River out by Snookhaven. Johnny Weissmiller was Tarzan. And a few of the monkeys in that film managed to escape, as monkeys do. Their descendants are still out there. Members of the carnival sideshow managed by Lou Woods spent their winters in trailers on Englewood Beach. According to Don Platt, who delivered newspapers there as a child, it was wonderful. I saw the fat lady, the thin man, everybody. They were all real nice, just regular people. Every now and then, the midgets would come over to the white elephant and get all tanked up. That was the best thing. They'd tumble and dance Why they'd put on a show I would dearly love to see today. This is Englewood. You're in for a treat. Bernie Redding is with us today. He came here in 1934 as a little boy with his mom and dad from Tampa. He's a local businessman, artist, author, but he is the finest storyteller you'll ever hear. The Lemon Bay Playhouse building at 96 West Dearborn Street goes back about 50 years. It was originally built to house the second Englewood Bank. The bank known as the first Englewood Bank was founded in the 1920s during a boom of prosperity that ended with the beginning of the Depression in 1929. A cashier of this first Englewood Bank was a Mr. Silky, a rather appropriate name, as it turned out, 
Mr. Silky departed one night to an unknown destination with the bank's funds. The first Inglewood Bank became history. The Inglewood Post Office, through the years. Inglewood has had several different post offices during the years, dating back to the early 1900s. The ones I am most familiar with are the ones that were around from the early 1930s on. I know that very early on there was some sort of post office down at the west end of Dearborn Street, but I am not familiar with that one. My first experience with the Inglewood Post Office was my daily job of going to pick up the mail. My dad was a carpenter, and his friends kept him informed of construction jobs where he might get work for two or three months in other areas of the state. We didn't have a telephone. There were not more than two or three phones in this area at that time. So that kind of information came by mail. We were living in a campground called Chadwick Park over on the quay near Inglewood Beach. And every weekday I walked from there to the post office and back to get the mail. At that time, the post office was in the Englewood Hardware Store on Dearborn Street. The total population of the Englewood area at that time was less than 500 in the summer. I can remember walking all the way over from Chadwick Park to the post office and back without seeing more than five or six cars pass by, even less than that in the summer. I really liked the lady who ran the post office at that time. Her name was Mrs. Green, and she was very friendly. She would talk, and when we found out that I liked to read, she offered to lend me some of her books. She had an extensive library. The next post office location was also on Dearborn Street at the northwest corner of Elm Street and Dearborn. The building was a surplus army barracks that was brought down from Venice Army Air Base after World War II. A gentleman named Harry Green was postmaster there for many years. We didn't have a rural postal delivery here in Englewood until the late 1950s. Until then, all mail was picked up at the post office. During the winter season, there could be as many as 10 or 15 cars parked at various angles around the post office with a scattered collection of people chatting and greeting friends they hadn't seen for several months. In the late 1950s, Joe Swinski, a local builder, built a large cement block building on the north side of Dearborn Street, and most of the space in the building was used for a new, larger post office. It was the best-looking post office we'd had up to that time, and we thought it was pretty high class. By the 1970s, our population had grown to the point that a still larger post office was needed. That new larger building was built out on River Road at the edge of town and still serves the needs of our community. Music